Hey everyone, welcome back. Today we're going to talk about radical expressions and functions. You've probably seen radical expressions before, something like the square root of 4, and the square root of 4 we know is 2. So a square root, b is a square root of a, if b squared equals a. So the square root of 4 is 2, because 2 squared is 4. Then we have a cube root. That's where if you have the radical sign and it has this little index of three and then a value such as eight. The cube root of eight is two. And that's because b cubed equals a, or two cubed in this case is eight. Then we talk about nth roots. An nth root is when you have an index n. So the index can be a square root, it's two, even though you don't see a two, a three for a cube root, you could see an nth root of four, five, six, really any value. And you take the nth root of some radicand. So the n here is called the index of the root. And the a that's inside the radical, this is called the radicand. So let's look at taking the nth root of different radicals. And we're going to follow this rule. So if a is greater than 0, then the nth root of a is going to be a positive number. But if a is less than zero, remember a's are radicand, and n, the index, is odd, then the nth root of a is going to be a negative number. But if n is even, then the nth root of a is not a real number. So what this is really saying, this last one, is that you can't take a root of a negative number. But that's only if you have an even index. So let's look at a few examples. We're going to evaluate the expression by hand if possible. Variables represent any real number. So in example one, we're taking the fifth root of negative 243. First, look at a. a is our radicand. Well, our radicand is less than zero. So that's where we have those two situations above. Now we need to look at our index, n. Is our index odd or even? Well, our index is odd. So, since it's odd, we know that our answer is going to be a negative number. So, we know it's going to equal a negative. So what we need to do next is we need to prime factor 243. Since 243 ends in a 3, that's a clue that 3 is one of the factors. And sure enough, if we factor out 3, we'd have an 81, because 3 times 81 is 243. And 81 is the same as 9 times 9. And each of those nines is the same as multiplying two threes. So 243 actually factors to three multiplied by itself five times. And when you take the fifth root, you're looking for groupings of five. So we have one grouping of five threes. So the answer is negative three. Now, example two, we're taking the fourth root of negative 16. So again, A, our radicand is negative. But here, N is an even number. Our index is four. So we know right off the bat that our answer is not a real number. And we're done. In example three, we're taking the cube root of x plus 1 to the 6th. Since we're taking the cube root, we're looking for groupings of 3. 
So notice that x plus 1 to the 6 is the same as x plus 1 squared three times. So our grouping of 3 there is x plus 1 squared. So the cube root of x plus 1 to the 6 is x plus 1 squared. Now let's look at square and cube root functions. Remember that a function is really just a machine. So the notation f of x is saying that we have a function called f and we're inputting values of x and seeing what comes out. So for example 1 and 2, if possible, evaluate the function at the given values of the variable. So we're going to evaluate example 1 with an x equals negative 1 and then with an x equals 5. So we're plugging in or calculating f of negative 1. So this is saying the function of negative 1 and we're putting in a negative 1 for all of our x's which gives us 3 minus 3 times negative 1. And now we just start simplifying that radicand. So negative 3 times a negative 1 is plus 3. So this is the square root of 6. And then we need to find the function of 5. And the function of 5, we have 3 minus 3 times 5, which is the square root of 3 minus 15, or the square root of negative 12. And remember, we can't take the square root of a negative number because it's imaginary. So right now we can just write not a real number. Now in example two, we're going to plug in values of negative three and four for x. So our function f of negative three would be the cube root of negative three squared minus eight. So the cube root of negative 3 squared is 9, 9 minus 8. So this becomes the cube root of 1. And the cube root of 1 is just 1, because 1 cubed is 1. And then the function of 4, so the cube root of 4 squared minus 8. So 4 squared is 16, and then 16 minus 8, we have the cube root of 8, which we know is 2, because 2 cubed is 8. Let's move on to page 2. Finding the domain of root functions. Now remember that the domain are the set of all x values for a function. And to find the domain of a square root is pretty easy. You just solve this inequality. The radicand has to be greater than or equal to 0, right? Because we can't take the square root of a negative. It has to be 0 or larger. So we're taking our radicand and solving the inequality. For these examples, it says find the domain of f and write your answer in interval notation. Example 1, f of x equals the square root of x plus 2. Our radicand here is x plus 2. So we're solving x plus 2 is greater than or equal to 0. So now we just isolate x. Subtract 2 from both sides. And we know that x is greater than or equal to negative 2. And in case you don't remember what that looks like in interval notation, negative 2 would be here on our number line. And everything that's greater than negative 2 is to the right. And because it's greater than or equal to, we use a bracket. So the interval notation is a bracket at negative 2 through positive infinity. 
Now example two, f of x equals 3x squared plus 4. So to find the domain, we take the radicand, 3x squared plus 4, and solve when it's greater than or equal to 0. And again, we just isolate x. So subtract 4, and we get 3x squared is greater than or equal to negative 4. Divide by 3. So x squared is greater than or equal to negative 4 thirds. And if you remember what it means to square something, you can stop here. Because whenever you square a number, you end up with a positive. So what values of x can you square and have a number that is greater than this negative? All. So all numbers. Or an interval notation, that would be from negative infinity through infinity. Now let's look at an application problem that involves radical functions. The function r of x equals 108 times the square root of x gives the total revenue per year in thousands of dollars generated by a small business that has x employees. Use r of x to evaluate r of 16 minus r of 15. If the salary for the 16th employee is $25,000, is it a good decision to hire the 16th employee? Well, let's do this math first and calculate r of 16 minus r of 15. So what does r of 16 mean? It means take our r function, 108 times the square root of x, and plug 16 in for the x. 16 is a perfect square, so the square root of 16 is 4, so this would actually be 108 times 4, or 432. 432 what, though? Well, r of x gives the total revenue per year in thousands of dollars. So this is 432 thousand dollars. So what this is telling us is that when we have 16 employees, our company makes $432,000 a year. So now let's calculate R of 15. R of 15 would be 108 times the square root of 15. 15 is not a perfect square, so we're going to plug that into the calculator, multiply it by 108, and we get approximately 418, or this would be $418,000 of revenue when we have 15 employees. So that means when we calculate R of 16 minus R of 15, we make $432,000 with 16 employees minus the $418,000 we make with only 15 employees. And that's a difference of about $14,000. Or by changing from 15 employees to 16 employees, our revenue grows $14,000. So $14,000 is the revenue earned, I guess generated, by employee 16. So now we get to the actual question. If the salary for the 16th employee is $25,000, is it a good decision to hire the 16th employee? Well, let's think about that. We're willing to pay this person $25,000 a year, but they only earn $14,000 in revenue for the company. So we'd be losing $11,000 every year just by hiring that person. So, as a good business owner, no, 
we don't want to hire that person because we would lose money. Have a question or a problem you want help with? Leave it in the comments and I'll include it in one of my videos. If this video was helpful, subscribe to my channel for more math tutorials. Thanks for watching. See you next time.